Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video 21. This is on homeostatic mechanisms and how they reflect evolution. Remember homeostasis is that internal stable environment and what we find is when we look in different organisms and how they maintain homeostasis we see this continuity. In other words we see a simple strategy that was once developed and has kind of run through that whole uh, lineage. We also find sometimes that the environment changes and with that change we'll see uh, divergence in the homeostatic mechanisms as well. And so one of the greatest discoveries of 2004 was Neil Shubin. Um, he discovered the Tiktaalik fossil in northern, northern, northern Canada, uh, and it's an intermediary. In other words, most scientists believe that life started in the oceans, uh, but vertebrate life moved from fish to amphibians to reptiles to birds, dinosaurs, mammals. So there's been this progression, but we lacked some of these transitional fossils. And so um, Tiktaalik is one of those transitional fossils. It's, it's pretty interesting. It had um, fins, so it could swim, but it also had gills, but it also had lungs, but it also had tetrapod-like legs. It also had a really uh, a mouth of nasty-looking teeth. And so this was like a fish alligator kind of a predator. Um, and it also represents a transition uh, from water to land. And so we can see all of these throughout um, life. And with that, we can trace evolutionary history. And so homeostatic mechanisms uh, show both continuity and they show change. And so um, continuity implies common ancestry or homology. The example I'll talk about uh, in this podcast is the excretory system. We can see that the excretory system in flatworms, earthworms, and finally invertebrates serve the same purpose. And so it's pretty much remained unchanged with some few tweaks over the last millions of years. We also find changes in the environment and that can cause changes in homeostatic mechanisms. Big example would be that movement from water on to land. In other words, as aquatic animals moved to terrestrial animals, there were huge constraints put on them, and as a result, they had to make a switch or a change in those homeostatic mechanisms. So let's start with continuity. Continuity remain, remain, remains the same, or in other words, it remains the same. The example, example I'll talk about, if I can start talking right, is excretory system. Excretory system serves two purposes. Uh, first one, and in us the big part of our excretory system is the kidney, first thing it does is it maintains osmolarity of the blood. In other words, it maintains the solute concentration in the blood. And in animals that's super important. The other big thing that it does is it filters our blood. Um, and so it, it serves those purposes, but it's done that through uh, vertebrates and even invertebrates for millions of years, and we can see some similarities through that. So again, briefly what we do is we filter the blood, we get rid of waste, uh, we also get rid of water or solutes if we need to. We then eventually move that into the bladder, we can get rid of it as urine. Um, but this is a problem that has plagued animals from, uh, from some of the first animals, and some of the first animals on our planet were flatworms. Uh, flatworms had to get rid of uh, excess water or solutes when they needed to um, regulate their osmolarity. And they also had to, especially terrestrial ones, they also had to get rid of nitrogenous waste uh, or urea. And so to do that, they call, use something called a, a protonephridia. And a protonephridia, there are going to be holes throughout the back of the flatworm and on the underside of the flatworm as well. And each of those are attached to a protonephridia. And what they have on one side is a flame cell. And a flame cell has cilia on it. And as those cilia move back and forth, what it does is it generates a current. And that current is going to move waste material, excess water, excess solutes out down a tubule, and then it's going to eventually move out of one of these holes. It's going to move into the environment. And so what I want you to get used to is this idea of a tube where we have to generate uh, some kind of a current so we can move material that we don't want outside of that organism. And it worked great and continues to work well for flatworms today. If we move forward from flatworms to something, a worm that's way more sophisticated than a flatworm, an example would be a earthworm. Earthworms have a, a circulatory system, a number of segments within that uh, worm itself, so really, really complex compared to a flatworm. What we find is that they have a tube as well. They've got a metanephridia, uh, and metanephridia will have a, a nephrostome on one side of a segment. So this right here is one setae or one segment within the worm. And so this would be what it looks like inside the worm. And so what it's doing is it's generating a current. That, that current, it's going to be moving down through a tube and eventually out through a hole. 
And if you've ever looked very closely on a worm, you'll actually see these holes on the underside of the worm. Now another thing that's interesting that we've added here is since we have a circulatory system, you'll see that the circulatory system is going to wrap around that tube. That's where you can get rid of excess water or excess uh, toxins within the worm. So we can move that to its environment on the outside. Um, so it's essentially the same with the addition of that circulatory system which wraps around it. And now let's go towards something uh, even more complex like us, vertebrates. In vertebrates we have a kidney. But if you look inside the kidney itself, you see this functional unit called the nephron. Well, what does the nephron have in it? It's got a tube. That tube will move all the way down and eventually moves to the bladder and eventually moves outside of our body. So think of that as like a hole. And they also have a circulatory system that wraps around that, uh, that tubule. And so we can get rid of waste. Um, and it also uh, can generate current. As the circulatory system moves in, excess material is actually going to move through that. And so we can see continuity in this excretory system, in this tubule of a flatworm, earthworm, and vertebrates. It's doing the same thing. Um, we have additional characteristics that are added to that, but it's been added to it uh, because of uh, external uh, environmental constraints. One big one would be the move to uh, terrestrial life. So that would be show continuity, but also in the evolutionary record we see change, and that's reflected in homeostatic mechanisms as well. And so the example I chose is the respiratory system. So what's the respiratory system do? Remember it's got to get oxygen from the environment into your body and get rid of carbon dioxide. Well, um, there are a few characteristics on both water and land for a good respiratory system. Number one, it's got to be uh, wet, and that allows diffusion. Next, it has to have a high surface area. And then the final thing that it has to have is it has to have some kind of a uh, thin membrane. So it's got to be a, a thin membrane. Uh, we also require oxygen. But that's a, a basic respiratory system. And so in water, it's generally gills. But on land, it's generally uh, the lung. And so let's think about water. Well, in water, is it wet? Yeah, it's pretty wet in water. Um, do we have a lot of oxygen in water? Uh, not so much. We have a low amount of oxygen in water, but we have a high amount of moisture, I'll say. As we move on to land, is it wet? No, it's actually really, really dry. And so we're going to have a low amount of moisture available. What about oxygen? Well, on land, we're going to have way more oxygen available. And so since there are these different uh, environmental changes that organisms have to um, withstand, they couldn't just keep using gills on land. They had to evolve uh, a lung which I'll show you the progression of how that actually um, occurred. And so if we look at the two strategies uh, of um, respiratory organs, we've got the gills in the fish, and we have lungs in things like us in mammals, in terrestrial organisms. And so how do gills work? Well, this right here is the operculum of a fish. And as the operculum kind of moves like this, what it does is it draws the water over the gills. And as it draws the water over the gills, we're going to take oxygen out and we're going to load carbon dioxide on that water and we're going to get rid of it. Um, now they have to be super efficient. They use a countercurrent exchange just to get all of the oxygen out of that water that we can because there's not a lot of oxygen available there. But since it is real moist environment, this whole thing is um, connected to the environment. In other words, as water moves through the mouth and out the operculum, it's not enclosed because it's just sitting in water. So there's no big deal. What about on land? Well, on land, and we don't need to worry about oxygen, so we don't have a countercurrent exchange. Uh, but we do have to worry about moisture. And so these things are tucked away in a mouse, tucked away safely inside the mouse. Uh, those are pretty long, big lungs. And so that we don't have to worry about losing uh, our, or water loss as we move. And so there was a progression uh, onto terrestrial. So once we went terrestrial from aquatic, then we saw this divergence in organisms. So every organism that lives terrestrial, vertebrate, is going to have lungs, and those that don't uh, are still going to have gills. And so we had this change within the homeostatic mechanisms. Now you may be thinking, where do we see the, the change in organisms? A great example of that would be in the lungfish. Uh, lungfish, this one here is an Australian lungfish. Um, what does it have? Well, it actually, if you were to cut it open, it's going to have lungs, but it's also going to have 
a gill that works and so it has both gill and lungs and so a lungfish is an example of a transitional kind of an organism it can breathe air so it can come up and gulp air and use lungs to break that down but it also can use a gill and so we can see something that has that transition and tiktolic has both gills and or had both gills and lungs as well now um how do we show that actually gills became lungs well if you think about that once we have this operculum right here if you close that operculum, then we can have essentially uh, the evolution of, of lungs coming from that. And so an example of that would be like in a frog. How does a frog breathe? Well, we breathe a little bit different than a frog. The way we breathe is that we use our diaphragm muscle to create negative pressure, and air pressure is actually going to push it in. But the way a, fr uh, uh, a frog breathes is it'll actually take air into its mouth, and then it will force that down. So it's actually squeezing the air down into its lungs. And so this musculature or the genes that make that push in this what's called buccal uh, breathing in a, a frog um, genetically is the same as the movement of the operculum or that two-stroke movement of the operculum. And so we can see not only transitional fossils, but we can see in the genes how there was this progression from uh, aquatic animals to terrestrial animals. And so that's homeostatic mechanisms. Again, it shows evolutionary history, and I hope that's helpful.